So the most remote from modern civilization that I've ever been was a few years ago now when I was 19. I was a long way away um, in Kyrgyzstan. And I was with my mate, and we'd spotted this wide, shallow glacial valley that looked kind of enticing, and we thought, screw it. We don't, have a, we don't have a map, but we've got a tent, we've got plenty of food. Let's just walk up that valley and see where it leads. We'd been walking for a week, and we'd seen nothing. No roads, no electricity pylons, no people, uh, no animals. And then suddenly, my friend elbows me, and he says, look behind you. And there behind us is this Kyrgyz boy. He was about eight, sitting on horseback, like he spent most of his life sitting on horse. And he was staring at us with the most intense expression on his face. We turn around, we try and say hi, and he rears his horse away, keeping it at a distance. So we wave, and he doesn't wave back. He just stares at us. So we kind of stand there, not really sure what to do. And then after a while, for want of anything else, we turn away and carry on walking. And we look over shoulder, and he's following us. After a while, I get an idea. I reach into my rucksack, get out a present, try and give it to him, and he rears away again. Whoa, you're not getting close to me with that present. So we turn away, carry on walking. And then after a while, without any warning, he just turns away and gallops over the hills. So as we were walking along in this weird, silent procession, my friend and I got to talking. My friend had ginger hair, and he said, you know, I bet this boy's never seen anyone with ginger hair before. <laughs> Even the clothes that we were wearing our Nike air trainers, our jeans, our rucksacks, were made out of material, possibly even dyed colors that he'd never seen before in his life. He was, I guess, a shepherd boy living in some remote homestead miles over the mountains, certainly at least seven days' walk from the nearest road, from the nearest electricity. The childhood that this boy was leading was a pretty unusual childhood for any child nowadays, but it wasn't at all unusual for any child anywhere in the world a few hundred years ago. Even as recently as 300 years ago, um, only 5% of the world lived in cities, compared to 50% now. And just as people lived uh, more remotely, um, so they also traveled much less. I read somewhere that the average person who lived 10,000 years ago only met 50 different people in the course of their entire life. Think how many faces that you've seen already today. And then imagine only seeing 50 different faces in your entire life. But that's not the only way in which this boy's childhood would be radically, fundamentally different to yours or mine. Living a life without electricity, with no way of seeing th something that wasn't physically there in front of him, would mean that his whole existence, his whole consciousness, was confined to the area that he'd physically seen with his own two eyes. This boy probably had no idea what an elephant was, or a jellyfish, or a whale, or things that any child nowadays would take for granted. I'm going to be talking today about how childhood has changed how the childhood that we spend, how, how, how we use our brains minute by minute and hour by hour has changed radically and beyond recognition in recent years. How different childhood is to the childhood that we spent when we were children and how that's different in turn to the childhood that our grandparents spent when they were children. Because it's not just over a time scale of thousands of years that things are changing. We live today at a time of unprecedentedly rapid development as a species. This graph is from a, a book by Ian Morris, and on the horizontal axis, we've got time going along. And then on the vertical axis, we've got a quantified measure of our social development as a species. And what we can see is that for most of our development, not much has really changed from one generation to the next. So I lived pretty much the same childhood as my, my grandparents lived. And they lived pretty much even the same childhood as their ancestors a 1,000 years ago. And then recently, things started to change. And when they changed, they started to change fast. The telephone, the first way of talking to someone who's not physically there in the same room as you, was made around about 1870. The television, the first way of seeing something that's not actually there in the room with you, first became widespread around about the 1950s. When I was young, I'm 39 now, uh, this was the computer that we had in my home. It was a BBC Micro, and I was well proud of it. But for me, as a psychologist who researches early years development, one of the most recent changes, one of the most important changes, come, came along even more recently than that, with the iPad in 2010. When I was young, to interface with a computer, uh, you needed to be able to operate a keyboard and a mouse, which meant that the minimum age for computers was, was around about six. Whereas nowadays, even a 12-month-old can interact pretty well with a tablet computer. So we've had this massive change from pretty much zero levels of interactive computer use in the 0 to 6-year age range through to quite high levels of use in some children now, lots of data showing that. 
And it's all happened since 2010. So, what, so we know that what we use our brains for has changed very radically and very recently. But why do I care? So I'm a psychologist who researches the development of stress and concentration abilities during the early years. Why do I care about these historical trends and how childhood has changed? Well, because of one thing, and it's an important thing, is because we know that the brain is plastic. What does that mean, that word? Well, uh, one of the most famous demonstrations of it came from uh, this experiment uh, done in the 1960s. And what these guys did was they took a family of genetically identical mice and they raised half of them in what they called an impoverished environment. So they were on their own in a cage with no one to play with, and no toys. And the other half of this family of identical twins, they raised in what they called an enriched environment. Um, so, uh, so they had exactly the same food, uh, but they had a different toy in their cage every day to play with. Different mates would come and visit them from the nearby cages. Um, and after these mice died, uh, they looked inside the brains, and they found out this really important thing, which is that the brains of the mice who, from the enriched environment, physically had more connections between the different cells in their brains. The wiring diagrams of their brains was more complicated. And that taught us this really important thing, which is that the brain changes depending on what we use it for. And that's what we mean when we say that the brain is plastic. OK, so we know that the brain is plastic. It changes depending on what we use it for. And we know that what we use our brains for, hour by hour and minute by minute, has changed very rapidly and very recently. So what are the effects of these changes? I'm going to be telling you about two ways in which childhood has changed. And then I'm going to be presenting some data, what data we have, on two ways in which we know that children nowadays are different to children of previous generations. I'm going to be trying to persuade you that the picture that's emerging is not all good, it's not all bad, it's somewhere in between. OK, so the first way in which uh, childhood has changed is that there's simply more information out there. So I was watching uh, this film, Gone with the Wind, with my wife the other night. It's a great movie made back in 1939. Um, and it starts with this text up on screen. So it comes up, I read it, and it's still there. So I read it again, and it's still there. And it's only after I've read it about 15 times that the text goes away. The amount of time, if you look back to those old films, the amount of time that they had to leave text up on screen before they could be sure that everyone had read it was much higher then than it is now. This is two uh, kids' TV shows, uh, one from 1954 and one from 2005. Um, and what I want you to be looking at here is the cuts, the moments where the camera jumps perspective, and your brain, brain is expected to jump from viewing a scene from one perspective to viewing it from another. And you can see that the speed of these cuts is much faster in the modern TV show. This is something that's been shown in many studies. So shot length, so that's the time between cuts, is going down over time. And that's another way of showing the same thing, which is the speed at which our brain is expected to process information has increased since we first started making film and TV. This is the same idea, in a way, in another way. So this is from a book by Stephen Johnson, again, looking at how TV shows have changed between the 50s um, and the present day. Um, and each row in these plots is a different character who speaks online, and each column across um, is a minute from the TV show. Um, and the square is black, um, if the character is speaking in that, that minute. So what we can see from this is the modern shows, there is just simply much more information in terms of number of different characters that you're expected to follow. So number of different characters, number of plots. So this has increased over time, just as the time dimension, the speed with which this information is decreased. So that's one way in which childhood has changed. There's simply more information out there. One really interesting and important question, and one which, to my knowledge, there's absolutely no research into at the moment, is what are the long-term effects of these changes? It's a scene we see um, all the time nowadays. Um, uh, many of us have experienced it. Uh, we're in a queue uh, with a toddler in a shop, or we're in a restaurant, or we're waiting for our luggage to come out of the airport. The toddler's getting fidgety, um, and we whip, into, we whip out our phone, we put on some TV, and we give it to them. And the toddler, who's previously been moving a lot, suddenly becomes stock still. Um, so we know that something about this presenting lots of information to a toddler has this short-term sedative effect. But what are the long-term effects? Is it the case that the more information that we have coming at us, the more we crave that information when we don't have it? Certainly, I find myself quite often now, when I'm walking down the street, have to inhibit the urge to uh, pull out my phone um, and read something as I'm going along. But is it the case that the more information we have, the more we crave it? We just don't know. Science doesn't know the answer to this question at the moment. 
So that's one way in which um, childhood has changed. We have more information now than we used to. The other way in which I think it's changed is that it's more interactive. And unlike the first type of change, where it's not really clear whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, I think most psychologists would probably agree that more interactive is good. So certainly we've had this big change in um, educational policy in recent years. Um, even when I was a kid, um, I remember um, sitting there in the classroom and the teacher would write out on the blackboard a long passage about a Tyrannosaurus Rex and we'd have to copy it down by word by word into our uh, notebooks. Whereas nowadays, teaching is much more about um, encouraging the children to ask questions and then telling them the answers. Uh, why is this? Because a lot of research is coming out uh, suggesting that interactive learning is just a more effective way of teaching things. Um, so if, I, if someone asks a question and then I tell them the answer to that question, they remember that answer much better than if I just told them and they didn't have a chance to ask the question first. And it turns out that this is something that technology is very good at. So take this, which is a, a screen from a phonics app. So I'm a kid, um, I'm playing this app, I've heard a noise, I've heard a particular sound, and then I'm looking at these little buttons uh, deciding which one to press. What I'm doing is I'm generating a hypothesis, maybe it's that one, and then I'm getting feedback on this hypothesis. So this is an interactive form of teaching. And from a psychologist's point of view, it's very good. Arguably, a teacher who's trying to teach phonics to 30 or 40 kids at once would really struggle to give this much detailed one-on-one -on -one feedback to all of the kids at once. But there's another side to this as well. So this is from um, a boy um, doing an experiment in our lab. Um, and he's in a different type of learning environment. So he's controlling uh, one monster uh, running away from another monster. Um, but from a psychologist's point of view, he's still learning, yeah? And he's learning in fundamentally the same way. Um, he's generating hypotheses, maybe I have to do that, and then he's getting feedback on whether the hypothesis was correct or not. So we were measuring uh, the stress systems in this kid's body as he was doing this. And it turns out that the feedback he was getting was registering really, really strongly on his stress systems. So he was controlling a character um, in simulated danger. There's a monster coming to eat him. But his stress systems are responding to this simulated danger as if it's real danger. So his fight or flight systems that ready our body to cope with actual physical danger are sky high, even though it's only simulated danger he's in. And every time he gets this uh, feedback, um, it registers really, really strongly on his stress systems. Another environment that um, many of us spend a lot of time in nowadays is uh, social media. So this is a learning environment too. So we're learning the rules of social interaction. Um, and it's a definitely a learning environment where many people are very motivated. So one thing almost everybody wants is to be popular. And the thing about social media is it's full of this type of feedback. It used to be when I was a kid uh, trying to work out you know, how to be popular in class, I'd make a comment, I'd make a joke, and then I'd have to kind of peer around at people's faces uh, to see what they thought of my comment. Um, whereas nowadays, within seconds of every post, you get these numbers, thumbs up and thumbs down. Um, so you get a lot of this type of feedback. So this is good for learning. Don't get me wrong. Interactive learning is more efficient. All I'm saying is it's very immediate and quite intense too. Does more feedback make us more sensitive? Again, this is a really important question that we don't have much data on at the moment. Speaking as a stress researcher, I know that there's some evidence that uh, the more stress that we experience, uh, the more, more sensitive we become to new stress when it comes in. Uh, so I think uh, there's a reasonable kind of uh, argument that the answer to this question should be yes, uh, but we just don't know yet. Okay, so that's two ways in which childhood has changed, more information and more interactive. The last part of my talk, I'm going to be telling you about two ways in which we know that children nowadays are different. Now, speaking as a scientist, I have to say the majority of the answer to this question at the moment is we just don't know. Think back to what I was saying earlier about this change that we've had in levels of uh, interactive computer use from pretty much zero levels before 2010 in naught to six-year-olds through to quite high levels in some children now. This has all happened in eight years, and science just can't keep up with this rate of change. Another problem is uh, there aren't enough tests that we've been giving in exactly the same form for a long period of time, which is what you really need to track historical changes. Um, brain scanning, for example, first came widespread about 10 to 15 years ago. Uh, so we just got no idea what people's brains were like 50 years ago. But one test that we have been giving to people um, in pretty much identical form for about 100 years uh, is this test. Uh, so this was designed by a, a British psychologist uh, called Charles Spearman, around about the turn of the last century. And he noticed that if you give a whole bunch of tests to a whole bunch of different people, uh, then by and large, uh, people who perform well at one type of test also perform well at another. 
Um, and he also noticed that this one particular test, this test of raw pattern spotting ability, was particularly good at predicting how well people perform at all the other tests. So we've been giving this test to children for 100 years now, and it turns out that children have been getting really quite a lot better at it. And these changes are really quite big changes, don't get me wrong. So a child who uh, scores 50th centile in a classroom nowadays, if you took that same child back to when I was a kid 30 years ago, that, that same child would be on the 72nd centile. So uh, we're getting smarter in terms of this kind of raw pattern spotting ability. Uh, the other type of change is more controversial, and it's that we are, we think, getting more stressed too. So we know certainly that diagnosis rates of uh, stress and anxiety and other mental health problems in young children are going up really quite fast. Um, but there's also some uh, questionnaire-based research looking at the symptoms of stress. So these are the uh, psychological symptoms, do I worry more than I'd like to, um, and the physical symptoms, uh, you know, shortness of breath, the feeling that your heart's kind of pounding and you can't control it. Um, and the weight of the evidence suggests that these kind of symptoms of stress are going up over time as well as our rates of diagnosis. So we're getting smarter, and we are, we think, getting more stressed too. And the question I'm going to leave you on today is, are these two things related? Again, this is a really, really important question we just don't know the answer to yet. It seems to me intuitive uh, that getting used to having lots of information coming at us uh, makes us crave that information when we don't have it. But nobody, as far as I'm aware, has looked scientifically at whether this is actually the case or not. And if it is the case, we don't know why. What are the mechanisms for this relationship? We also don't know whether having lots of information coming at us improves our ability to spot patterns in that information, whether there's a, there's a relationship between uh, the amount of information we consume and fluid IQ, fluid intelligence. And finally, we don't know about feedback whether it has this double-edged effect uh, that we think it might, that it makes us better learners, faster learners, but more sensitive too. These are, I think, all really, really important questions for the future of our species. So if anyone's interested in uh, trying to find out the answers, then get in contact with me and we'll have a go. But where does it leave us now? Well, for me, it's a mixture, I think, of awe-inspiring and scary. Awe-inspiring in that um, our children's brains are probably the most powerful information processing machines that there have ever been in our history as a species. Scary in that they're fragile too. This constant buffeting of information, of feedback, makes them more likely to get overwhelmed, more likely to let things spiral out of control. This is where our children are now, perched right on the tip of this graph, standing higher than we've ever stood before as a species, but precariously balanced. It's exciting and a bit scary at the same time. Thank you.